Central Public Library presents the fifth annual Library Lip On. Today, I'm here with Stephanie Bratton Chen and Eddie Benton Court, and we're going to be discussing a panel about character design. And my name is Carson LaRue, and I will be the panelist. And I'll let you guys give your little introduce yourselves to everybody. All right. Well, uh, let's see. My name is Stephanie. Um, and I'm currently a lead animator at Zynga, and I'm working on uh, uh, Harry Potter puzzles and spells right now. Um, I started off in television animation, actually, um, doing a couple of shows for Fox, FX, uh, and you know a little bit of advertising here and there. Uh, and I graduated from the Art Institute of Tampa in Florida. So I've been traveling around a lot. I've gone from Florida to Arizona um, to Texas, you know, wh wherever I needed, basically. And I kind of ended up settling in mobile gaming, which I've really enjoyed compared to a lot of the uh, um, other jobs I've had. And my partner in crime is Eddie. I, I mean, we basically did all the same things together. Um, uh, I got into mobile gaming uh, in the past couple of years here. I'm a uh, animator for a Game of Thrones uh, slots game. Um, before doing all that, I used to work at uh, Powerhouse Animation Studios doing all kinds of stuff, anything between storyboarding, character designs, and in-between animation and all that. Um, so, so I've got to work on a couple of cool shows, um, some commercials also, doing stuff for like Nickelodeon and uh, like Disney and... Um, I think Activision. Yeah, and, right. There's what you game right. studios. <laughs> it's, it's funny because I've done a lot of work in animation for games, and I eventually got into a game studio after a while doing animation for games so <laughs> yeah so we both started in tv and ended up in games <laughs> yeah pretty much that's awesome and of course you guys have the amazing amazing graphic novel rebel rouser it's mm -hmm. incredible the art is absolutely beautiful thank, thank you, you. <laughs> So I wanted to start off, a panel is a lot about character design. And can you guys tell us what exactly character design is? Uh, I mean, it's, it's basically developing all of the, uh, uh, just the look and feel of a particular show or even like a comic series or anything. Yeah, just the people that are going to take up the, uh, the environment and make the story. Uh, and character design is a lot more than just making cool looking characters. You really have to analyze you know, the shape language of each character, what what you what impression you want the character to give at a glance, because oftentimes, especially on TV, uh, you only have a, a moment to really capture the attention of the audience. So you want their shapes to be very distinct. You want to be able to know what this character is about, who they are just by how they carry themselves. So it's a lot of it is uh, being able to analyze physical acting too, just physical shapes and people. Yeah, like you kind of want to look into like, uh, like you know, if you have a more friendly character, they're probably going to have much more of a round shape to their overall shape yeah. language, or if they're more something softer. Yeah, if they're more evil. They might have sharper edges to them, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Just something that you know, uh, you can quickly identify as yeah. you're like flipping through the channels or flipping through a page. Yeah, that's awesome. And then, what has been your favorite characters to kind of design? Um, honestly, I feel like for me, uh, just the characters for our own uh, our own project, Rebel Rouser. Yeah, I mean, just stuff from our own personal projects. Mm -hmm. um, like I like doing a lot of uh, monsters and like alien ghosts and ghouls yeah. designs. I, I love I love drawing all that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the fun thing, especially about creatures, is that you can basically do anything you want. Whereas with you know humanoid characters, you, you have like rules that you have to follow, obviously. Um, but with with creatures and aliens, you can do anything and just focus purely on the the shape language itself. Yeah, you're not confined to like, all right. Well, if this is human, they clearly have to look human. But with like a monster or alien, you they can have fifty want. eyes, yeah. you know, three legs, whatever you want. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awesome, though. I'd love a fifty eye, three legs monster. <laughs> I'm sure there's a Pokemon that looks like that. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Or you guys could make it and put it in the deck. <laughs> oh, <Rouser. laughs> we could do that too. <laughs> and I mean, speaking of Rebel Rouser, can you tell us a little bit more about that and its creation, the process, everything behind that? So that kind of developed uh, 
we we've had these uh, two ma- the two main characters uh, Aiden and Rosie. We've had them kind of just as characters we would doodle for a while, but we never really developed a story around it. And I think it was actually you know as we started traveling uh, the U.S. more, especially New Orleans, we kind of fell in love just with that that feeling of Americana, the open road, road trip sort of vibe. And we had started developing a story around that, you know, two, two, you know, all American teenagers just out on an adventure. And we just, you know, with, with the weird, uh, um, or the fun kind of vibe in New Orleans, we started to apply like, you know, uh, mythos and American legends and all that things that you don't really see too much of. Like you see a lot of stories about, um, you know, Loch Ness monsters and, uh, cryptids that are overseas, but nothing like super specific to the U.S. So, you know, we, we discover a lot of interesting uh, local myths like the Grunge Road Monster. Yeah, I was just about to bring that up. Yeah, because for, for this one, or for this story specifically, we really want to bring focus to just like mythos and legends that originate here mm-hmm. in the Americas. And yes, the even if they're monster. ridiculous, <laughs> yeah. even if they're absolutely ridiculous. Um, just because you don't really see that too often. I just mm-hmm. think that'd be really cool. I mean, the ridiculous ones are always the best ones, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. The Florida Skunk Ape is uh, uh, near and dear to me being a flirty. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> How was the process of, of creating the comic different from what you guys normally do? I mean, honestly, at least for me, it's not that much different from um, just doing storyboardings. Or storyboards, um, just because you know you you're figuring out the layout of like the scene and all that. Except for like now for comics, now I'm figuring out the uh, just the look and feel of how the panels are going to be laid out on the page. Because mm-hmm. you have but, to view that as one composition now. Yeah, yeah. But just the uh, the process of figuring out like what angle I want in each panel is very similar to when I used to board. Yeah, I think the prep is really similar. The only major difference is that we can actually get away with more detail because we don't need to streamline it as much for animation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have to make it look like chicken scratch. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, definitely when you're focusing on TV animation, you want to keep the shape as distinct and simple as possible for the sake of animation and for speed. Whereas with with comics, we don't have to worry about that too much. Yeah, I can go as detailed as I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've kind of touched on this already, but I'm really curious. I mean, you guys have gone through so many different mediums. I mean, you've done game design, animation, TV animation, all of that stuff. How is it different to use all these different mediums to like betray your characters? Does it feel different? Is there a style you prefer more? Um, I think the main difference is just we, you know, we have our total creative freedom. Whereas with, you know, when you're working at a studio, you're usually beholden to somebody else's ideas. Yeah. I think especially my, uh, my time over at Powerhouse, because they kind of really, I went in there mostly uh, doing a lot of in-between animation and cleanup. And then eventually they put me on character design and they basically just turned me into a jack of all trades. Then I started doing boarding also. Um, I think taking everything I learned from doing all those different jobs there um, really helped out when it came to putting this story together, because now I kind of, picked up on uh, things I should keep an eye out for, like, okay, well... Uh, and it's made us uh, be able to analyze a lot better. Our yeah. Approach. Um, yeah oh, I lost my train of thought <laughs> as I was talking, but... Uh, yeah, I think what's really cool about the fact that we've, we have done so many different things is that we're very self-sufficient now. We can, we can produce our own comic or our own animations for the comic, which we are doing. Um, yeah, we're making like a, an animated intro for ourselves and we don't really have to rely on anybody else to do that since we've been t- we've kind of taught ourselves everything well, yeah and basically everything we've learned uh from doing all those different jobs we've been able to apply mm-hmm. on working on this comic also yep that's really cool though to be so independent and create your own vision i mean it helps to have a partner crime to <laughs> I, I work better with the team, and so, you know, working with my husband is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> so, what, in your mind, makes a good character? Oh, man. Um, I think, regardless of whether, you know, they're an antagonist or protagonist, as long as they are likable somehow, if there's something about them that you can relate to as a viewer, I think that's really important. Because you can have... 
you know, maybe evil characters, but you have to be able to root for them somehow, even if, you know, for, even if it's something that is, you know, I can relate to why they're frustrated with this, you know, particular situation, even if they're going about it the totally wrong way, they have to have some charm. Yeah, I, I, to me, like, I think I always feel like the greatest like villains are always the ones that feel like they're doing the right thing, but they're apparently not or not. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it's it, like uh, it, it's that humanizing element that's yeah. really important, no matter what kind of character you put on screen. Because if you don't care about the character, you're not going to care about anything else. You don't care about the world, the story, nothing. Yeah, I think relatability helps a lot. Mm-hmm. Relatability is really important. And it doesn't matter if they're the good guy or the bad guy. You can still relate to them somehow and mm-hmm. see their point of view. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, on the topic of relatability, I think that's one of the things I really appreciate now with uh, the focus on representation is that uh, there's a lot more opportunity for a wider audience to relate to characters. You know, they see themselves on screen and they're like, oh, you know, this, I, I understand this. I understand this perspective. Yeah. No, that's I totally that's agree really with that. cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, I mean, the diversity that we're seeing now is like really awesome. And I mean, it kind of goes on this idea that I, uh, what, how do you think game design and just character design in general is changing the world right now? I think it's a really good medium that is approachable to all, all age groups and all, all demographics in that it's it's easy to digest and you can you can kind of go you know to the wall with any style of storytelling you can make it as fantastical or as grounded as you want um and it, it's similar to you know movies where it helps you helps put you in a different perspective or a different uh situation I, i'm not sure if i'm explaining that right but no, I mean, a good example i think is spider-verse you know yeah yeah for sure i i that was one of the first films in a long time where i i really felt it and i didn't expect it because mm-hmm. you, you see you know a lot there's so many superhero movies you expect it to be a cash grab but that one actually had a lot of uh heart and intent in it and i, I i'm excited to see so much more of that yeah yeah uh-huh. I, I think it's a good way to you know help people understand um different perspectives for sure Oh, Spider Verse! Oh my gosh, that's still one of my like favorite movies right now. I'm just like, <laughs> I, was it. I was shocked by how how much I enjoyed it. I think I have to look at a, a Puerto Rican superhero. I know. <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> oh, and that kind of goes off one of the. I think one of my favorite questions: What are your favorite characters in? Games, TV, movies, graphic novels, comics, just anywhere. What are your favorite characters? I always like shows. Um, I guess the best example is something like Futurama. Where <sighs> yes. <laughs> it's like the they know how to balance uh, comedy with the drama also. Um, and so you see, like, you can see, like, a character like Fry, like, he's always doing something stupid. But then you have a very poignant moment that comes in, which brings in the relatability of being like, okay, well, I get where he's coming from now. And then you go back to the comedy again. I, I, I love that. I mean, I, I like <laughs> that too, because it has balance, just like life does. You appreciate those really, uh, those really joyful moments, especially yeah. when that sort of thing happens, like something serious, something really, you know, shocking happens. It makes those, those small moments matter between, you know, the, character interactions like the, the relationship building well, yeah like i think the the most recent show that i've like i love that really handled that well too was gravity falls yeah like, yes, was, like, yes, yes. <laughs> like the whole second season i don't know like the, the right like the writers they, they felt like they came straight from like uh just somebody from that show from like like futurama or like some like the earlier shows in the 90s like, that's what it felt like to me, how like snappy the writing was. I think that's a really good um, example of like digestibility across like uh, a vastly different age group. You know, like this is really relatable to younger kids and adults yeah. for different reasons. And I think that's really valuable. Yeah, for sure. And I would love to see more of that. I think there, you know, for a long time, there was a stigma of animation, especially being for kids, which is strange because a lot of it did start for adults um, during its onset. But, you know, we don't need to always baby children with storytelling. They're a lot smarter than we give them credit for. Yeah. Right <laughs> and it's important to tell these sorts of stories um, at a young age, I think, because it helps with the you know emotional growth. I mean, I'm, that's my opinion. I don't know. But I, I, I like treating your audience no matter what age they are with respect. 
And that yes. is a long story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 100% agree. And that's kind of our aim too with Rebel Arousers. We want it accessible to a lot of uh, different age groups for different reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, speaking of like character development and everything like that, when you're making a character, what comes first? Is it the backstory, what they're involved with, or is it how they appear? Uh, for me, I usually try to go with like a uh, some sort of history. So that way I kind of know what angle to start with. Like, okay, if they're like a pirate of some sort, okay, well, they're a pirate. They plunder and do whatever. All right, well, so I'm going to start from there. Maybe... Like general to specific. Yeah, right? yeah. I kind of go from like, yeah, just like a general to specific as I get more of uh, the details in on the design. So I kind of start similarly. And I what an interesting that happens and... Uh, I don't know if this is the correct way to go about it, but as I start drawing the character, they kind of develop a personality of their own. And um, and I start developing more bits of writing or more history and personality behind that character based on these doodles. Because I just think, oh, you know, this seems like something a pirate character would do. Now I'm starting to get more information. Okay, they, they enjoy, uh, you know, they're not a violent uh, pirate or something. Maybe they just like looking for treasure because this one doodle had a bunch of treasure maps around them. Like it, it kind of feeds into each other. It's a really, it's a kind of a messy process, but that's kind of how I approach it. What are, in your opinions, what are the biggest challenges when it comes to character design? Do you have a specific issue you always have trouble with, or is it all just kind of naturally flowing out? Um, I think for me is I, I just, I try to avoid, um, drawing or designing something that I've already seen before, which can be kind of difficult when, um, you know, clearly like a lot of like your influences, like they're going to creep in as you draw and design. And so I always have just like have to keep raising, like, no, okay, I, I can tell that I'm, like, I'm starting to like. <laughs> He's thrown so many really good character designs to the trash because like, this looks like another character. I, too much, I don't like it. Yeah. It's, yeah, Even it's though a I think stickler. it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he's really, he's a, yeah, he's a huge stickler for a, a unique character silhouettes, which is, you know, is absolutely fair. Um, I think I kind of work around, I, I give a little bit more leeway for myself, and I think my workaround is just by the physical acting rather than the shapes. You know, so if their silhouette is similar to another character, I'm hoping that their personality and their, their physical acting, how they carry themselves is distinct enough that it, you, know, you can differentiate them. What's your biggest piece of advice for someone who wants to get involved in this kind of field and wants to tell so many stories? Oh man, one of the... don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say just communicate, network, and talk to as yeah. many people as you can. I know it's Go to really yeah. And I know it's like really that. difficult as artists because a lot of us tend to be much more reserved, and myself included. Um, but it's really important to communicate and connect with other artists and other people because that only empowers your own stories and characters a lot more and you can apply that to your character designs. Um, definitely uh, don't, it, again, this is easier said than done because there are times where I can't even follow my own advice, <laughs> but you know, don't take things too personally, you know, look for critiques, even if it's hard because that's the best way to improve your work and get where you want to be. And that, that's kind of related to, you know, trying not to be too shy either. Just reach out to people. Yeah. Uh, people are, are a lot kinder and nicer than sometimes we might think. A lot of, most of us all want to help each other, you know? Yeah, for sure. Especially in the art field. Mm. <laughs> We're just like so sweet. <laughs> and again, I, I, I want to emphasize, I get that it's really hard. I still have a hard time, you know, doing that. I still need to remind myself that, uh, you know, nobody, most people aren't out to get you. They, they want to help as long as you're sincere, and genuine. That's important. <laughs> yeah, no, I have to remind myself of that on occasion, too. <laughs> Who are your favorite artists? I mean, and not just limited to like painting or drawing or anything like that, but like expanded to game design and just everything that that entails. I mean, it could be on TV, it could be book covers, anything. I feel like I have a lot. I have I mean, to like really like yeah. hmm? Oh, I love Bruce Tim. Yeah, Bruce Tim, uh, Joan and Vasquez. Uh, I can't think of like all my big influences. Oh, what's the guy that did the um the gorillas designs? Oh, Jamie Hewitt. Yeah, Jamie I love Hewitt. Jamie and, and Hewitt. And the other dude too. The other dude too. Um, he did the Beatles rock band art as well. Oh, uh, his 
Uh, Tip of my tongue. It's Robert Valley. Robert Valley. Yeah. 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 Um, we definitely, you know, not related to um, directly to, to animation, but another big influence is definitely the music of gorillas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I really like gorillas. That's a big influence on us. Um, that's, I, anytime I'm kind of like lacking any sort of like mojo or inspiration to draw, I just like slap with one of those songs and I'm like, okay, I can. Something's coming. It might not look good, but something's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am curious. How does that work? I mean, uh, using another art form to inspire you. I mean, do you do that a lot when you're creatively blocked? What's your process to get unblocked? I think oh, it's getting yeah. the, the emotion, I guess. Yeah, I think for me, whenever I'm having like a serious art block, um, what I try to do is I just kind of look back at all my... Uh, all the artists that I've been influenced by and just kind of look at their work and then just try to sort of not so much because I don't want to say no, no copy will basically kind of draw something similar to their design because I've noticed for me breaking out of my own style and trying something new usually destroys the art block for me and then it gets the motor going and I can go back to doing my thing um yeah it's me yeah I, I'm Totally the same. Just doing something totally outside of what you usually do is a, can be really refreshing. Yeah, because I think, uh, especially for artists, um, sometimes you can kind of get a little too comfortable with where you're at and kind of become complacent. And breaking out of that is a good way to kind of like, I guess, lack of a better, to, lack of better, or better term, just level up, I guess. <laughs> like, oh. What a gamer. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that's why it's really important to keep up with things like figure drawing or uh, you know, more traditional um, art styles because it does. It's so different that you know if you're frustrated with one, you can go to the other and just kind of practice your foundations. Yeah, or you know, do exactly what Ava's doing too. Is just look at your original inspirations and uh, kind of emulate what they're trying to do. <laughs> So I think we're coming to the end of the panel, but I do have a couple more questions. I am really curious. We've talked about your favorite games. We've talked about your favorite backstories, everything like that. But what have been just the best overall designed characters that you've ever seen? Mm, that's hard. I know. I'm trying to think. Uh... I'm going to be biased and say some of my favorite character designs are the gorillas design because they are very distinct. I was just about to say that. Okay, too. I was like, we're married. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the first thing that pops to mind. And you you can tell so much by those characters just, you know, first with their silhouettes. If you take out all the details and just look at how they stand, how their shapes are designed, how they carry themselves, you can start reading their personalities very clearly, especially like the... um the earlier phases of the uh, the designs. Yeah, um, definitely a lot more, uh, like their shapes are definitely a lot more pushed in the uh, first album, mm -hmm. first, first and second album, actually. Yeah. And I think the one thing I love about the uh, Jamie Hewlett's designs too is, it's like they're, <laughs> they're kind of gross in a way. Like yeah. they're not, they're, they're imperfect. If like, you look at their details, yeah. they, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting, uh, like they're very appealing designs, but then when you look at like like Murdoch or Two D, and you like kind of look at how he drew, like you know they have like almost like a dad bod, mm -hmm. like it's like their their chests are sunken in, but they have a belly. There's, also. Some, there's some patchy fuzz going on yeah. it's everywhere. You know? They just they they're imperfect looking, which makes them look yes. even more human. That, that's a really so, good uh, uh, word. It's yeah. the imperfection is really really grounding. Yeah, I, I think that's. Amazing. I like imperfect characters. So. <laughs> now, where do you see? Characters uh, design going in the next like five years, the next 10 years. What do you see for its future? So I, I feel like we're kind of circling back around to um, a little bit more of a retro style of animation where like, we're going backwards now, right? Because um, now there's a lot of uh, designs, especially in film animation and, and honestly in TV that are focused on like a UPA style which is yeah. very limited animation, very distinct shapes, um, kind of graphic looking. Mm -hmm. And I think we're even going further back now with things like Cuphead and returning to the Looney Tunes shows and things like that, where we're, we're starting to get back those, you know, those cartoony anthropomorphic characters as well. Yeah. Even like the, the new Mickey Mouse shorts that came, I guess they're not new, new now they've been out for a while, yeah. but 
I felt like that was kind of like the start of just that style coming back. Um, they kind of they drew Mickey and the crew. They all looked very similar to their uh, older yeah. incarnations. It was like a, a modern sort of um, comedy style, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did they just? Uh, well, no, I don't think Cuphead's out yet. It's coming no, it's out soon, yet. though. But yeah, I felt like the the whole retro style is starting to come back now. It's starting to come into style. Everything's which I circular. Love. It's amazing. <laughs> Oh, me some old school Loon mm-hmm. tunes. <laughs> I think that, you know, as, uh, especially now with uh, the pandemic, there's a lot of focus on animation because that's one of the few industries in entertainment that isn't affected, really. Um, there's going to be a, a revival, I think, of more, I don't know how else to put this, but more animated cartoons where it's not, a, a lot of TV animation tends to be very uh, quickly done and very, uh, you know, they, they have a small turnaround, so the animation isn't as fluid or frame by frame as it might have been in the past. Uh, but I think they're going to be affording more time to that now, a lot more budget because mm-hmm. um, there's, is, there is a need for it. Where do you guys see your own careers going in the next five, 10 years? I mean, are you going to release more comics? Are you interested in different avenues? I think, I mean, I think I'm at a point now where I'm kind of, um, not that, that I, I love uh, where I'm working at right now, um, but I definitely want to start pursuing my my own stuff, which is why we're doing the comic right now. Like I've I've, I've worked on everybody else's stuff, now I want to work on my own. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at too. You know, uh, professionally, I'm work I'm focusing a lot on uh, the management aspect of it. You know, like I said, I'm a lead animator right now, so that's been really great. I I've been around the industry for a bit, so I can help guide you know, a vision a little bit better. But for my personal stuff, I, I really want to just focus on telling my own story without the, the, uh, everything else, like the politics of the studio, the producers, everything. I want full creative control. Yeah. And that's really nice that, you know, we have the time to afford to that. It's awesome. And it's been lovely talking to you guys and just so great learning more about, just everything. You guys are just so awesome. I'm hu- a huge fan, like I've said before. But do you guys want to <laughs> tell us where we can find you? Do you want to promote anything? Oh, sure. Um, well, let's see. My my Instagram is my very long name. So, uh, it's a S Ratana Chan. Um, maybe we could type that out or something because it's, that's a mouthful. We'll put it right here. <laughs> And then uh, my my Instagram's at uh, uh it's uh, Edders E D D E R Z Z. And then you can find our websites eddiedraws dot com or stephsdrawings dot com. And I also you know to whoever's watching this, I have a fairly open door policy. That, you know, if you're an artist and you're looking for you know advice or mentorship or anything, you know, I don't have a whole lot of free time. But if you send an email, I'll do my best to you know look at your portfolios and offer. You know, any any advice I can, because I think when we were starting out, it was really difficult for us to find that sort of guidance, you know, without paying a hefty sum, which is fair. You know, you, you know, if you have a service, you, you should be able to, um, you know, make, make money off of it or whatever. But, you know, a lot of people don't have that opportunity or the funds to do that, especially when you're younger. So, yeah, feel free to send an email my way and I'll try my best to respond to everything. I don't mind at all. Yeah, same here. Yeah. <laughs> Let us help you guys. You guys up. You'd be surprised at how many people don't take up that offer. But <laughs> a lot of it is the assertiveness, you know, communicate with people. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much for all your panel. And co- I'm just, this was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having us. Thank you. 